I think an increasing challenge for leaders is to manage multiple and competing stakeholder groups. And I think the starting point for that is, is respect. You must respect the position that stakeholder groups have. So that firstly means sitting down with them and talking to them, explaining to them your position. So it may be that they have an issue with something that you're doing or they don't understand uh, the objectives or the strategy of your organisation. It might be that they see that as negatively impacting on them. So the first thing is to sit down and communicate exactly what you're doing and why you're doing it. And then listening to them uh, when they say, well, that's why it's not working for us. You know, these are the impacts on us. So having a proper discussion. I, I often think leaders don't listen very well. I, I do remember a particular director saying in a board meeting one day, when I suggested that we should go and talk to the shareholders about a particular issue, he said, oh, we don't need to talk to the shareholders. And I said to him, they're only the owners of the company. So he, it was lost on him, actually. He didn't think that was very amusing. But uh, that is, that's the reality, that these stakeholder groups have validity and they have standing and you must accord them respect. And frankly, when you talk to them, often you can find common ground. And you know, you can get to that point where there's consensus and common ground. It may be that there'll never be a meeting of the minds on particular issues. You might be able to trade off something to give them some compensation, or they may just say, look, we accept it. And you might just say, I'm afraid for us, this is non-negotiable, we'll do everything we can to ameliorate the impacts on you, the negative impacts on you, but this is where we're at. So, for me, it's all about that open communication and listening, and by and large, you can get to some sort of reasonable accommodation and certainly take the angst out of uh, those relationships, which you often see uh, lead to very toxic sort of circumstances. Consensus, consensus is really important, provided it's not the lowest common denominator of something that, that people have to agree on before you move forward. And sometimes you have to move forward without a consensus that's unanimous, in which case you don't ever put it, anything to a vote. Uh, when you have a meeting of people, you'll generally know, you know where there'll be issues and to try and resolve it before the meeting happens. And if it's not happening uh, during the meeting, if it's not the highest common, the highest common value or common factor, um, and it's sliding in the lowest common denominator, best to pull out of the meeting and rearrange it and make excuses and get out of there and change the turf the next time round. The the object at the end of the day is is getting everyone in the same boat and everyone throwing in the same direction. So Committee for Perth in, in its membership alone contains 107 very different sets of views, uh, commercial outcomes that they're seeking, but yet we've managed to produce these landmark reports that have been defining for Perth because they're by Perth and for Perth and they have a very unified perspective on the action that needs to be taken. And so that's about creating the evidence base, having a very good scope of work that people can sign up to and then getting the evidence base, sharing that widely so that it's not about having an exclusive set of information that not everyone is privy to, being very solutions focused, uh, being outcomes driven and holding yourself to account for the outcome. So in the case of filling the pool, you know, the project that uh, we worked on together, 82 times that's been presented to a range of groups and not once have I had the sort of pushback that you would expect. I mean, it was a very controversial report and it's talking about a lot of things that need to change, both systemic and cultural, and yet most people buy into it. Mm.